we have a lot to cover in this uh, you know session of ours. So I'm, you know, we're going to you know speak as fast as we can. So what I thought of doing with Chris is to give you a quick primer of what machine learning and AI is. All these topics you hear in the news, you know, blockchain and crypto and AI, and you know, I see a lot of executives treating them as if they are some magical thing you can weave at your biggest problem at the firm, and all of a sudden everything uh, is nice and rosy. That's not really the case. So we're going to do our best to demystify within 20 minutes, although in my own program at Columbia, I take, it takes me two days to run an executive education class on the topic, uh, but we shall do our best within 20 minutes. We'll do it in 20 minutes. Yes. <laughs> so in essence, uh, one of the characteristics that set us apart uh, from most other uh, beings on this planet is the fact that you're very good at recognizing patterns. Uh, if you look at you know, the history of you know, thousands of years ago, people were able to predict solar eclipses and, 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 and celestial events purely based on you know, collecting data and recognizing patterns. In fact, we are so good at it that sometimes we see patterns where there is none. Uh, so in the world of business, if you think about it, we went from a point in time we just could collect data and kind of, and kind of know what our business um, has been doing whenever you know you create a financial statements in general you're just collecting data creating a snapshot of how your business is doing at that specific moment and that's all we could do and then in the late 70s and early 80s with the advent of relational databases all of a sudden you could do a lot more for, for instance you can figure out how many of your clients are is living in or uh, in a specific zip code in the US believe it or not at some point in time that would have taken two three weeks of engineering time to figure it out going through your files and your your um, um, you know f folders and so on and so forth but all of a sudden we could do it with a couple of clicks so we went from a point in time in which we could kind of know what happened to our business. We call it our descriptive um, uh, kind of data models to understanding what's happening at the moment. We can collect more data now. We have lots of more sensors and, and, and uh, ways of understanding how our, how our businesses are doing at the moment. What are my sales at the moment? So we call it uh, uh, descriptive. And then slowly, slowly, we're having more and more data. All of a sudden, we can kind of plan to understand why something happened. Um, we call it uh, uh, prescriptive data. Uh, and now we are morphing into a point in time that we are trying to understand, OK, so we went from understanding what happened to my business, what's happening now, what is going to, to happen, to a point in which we could try to make something happen. You know, could I make this happen? And that's the realm of machine learning and AI. So with that premise, uh, you know, fairly you know, high level, uh, let's talk about um, you know, machine learning as a foundation for, <clears throat> for AI in, first and talk about the limitations and, and, and the challenges, also opportunities uh, around it. Uh, and specifically, let's start with the notion of supervised learning. Um, tell us you know, what is supervised learning and um, you know, we open the conversation from there. Well, in the end, supervised learning is, is what we all do all the time, is uh, we uh, don't let a machine just experiment by itself where it should find a, a, and, and find a positive way to towards a goal. We actually show it correct things um, and have it try to reproduce those in, in an easy way, right? It's, it's a little bit boring, actually, right? And, and most, of, most of the time in, in these environments goes into... Um, Finding the right data set you can use your uh, you can use to teach the machine like the basics and then have it experiment by itself, which where you go from a supervised to an unsupervised model. So in essence, you need a large data set to begin with. You can train your machines on, and hopefully have the machine be able to replicate or that learning on a different data set. Which is the problem of, of machine learning, right? In AI, we kind of we're kind of these visage apprentices. I mean, AI has been going up and down for for what 50 years now, and um, once we find an algorithm that does something pretty cool, we all think, well, now this one algorithm is going to solve it all, and, and it just won't, right? So um, currently, we're into machine learning, and machine learning is supposed to solve it all, um, but it won't, because there is never enough data to describe now. So in essence, machine learning, at least the supervised learning part, is quite data hungry. You need a lot of data. Uh, and even if you have a lot of data, that may still not be enough, i.e. you could have data, let's say you want to predict the movement of the stock market. If you have 15 years worth of data from 1990 to 2005, if you train a machine on that, would that machine be able to predict what happened in 2007? 
Well, obviously not, because uh, as all the legal paragraphs under everything keep saying is that uh, the past is no indication for the future, um, because there might be cataclysmic events that change everything. And let's also talk about biases. Um, what are the inherent challenges of introducing you know, biases, whether warranted, or known or unknown, um, into your training data set that might you know, have implications downstream of that? Look, wherever you have humans, you have biases. I mean, my personal favorite Wikipedia page is the page of human biases. And if you were ever able to reproduce this kind of a complex system of things that pull and tag at your neutrality, and we might even get there with the machine, but it's, it's rather impossible. Um, so generally, um, because we, we give mach machines a starting point, we select the data set we use to train them, we give them the parameters they can be curious on and so on and so forth. There's definitely always bias in this. I used to do this in my data science classes. I gave people um, a data set with three different sets of labels. And boy, would you not believe what these people found in the data. <laughs> Well, one of the things I like to say is that if you torture your data long enough, it would confess to anything. <laughs> so it's just a matter of finding correlation and causation. In fact, that's actually a good point. So uh, let's talk about correlation and causation for one second. Um, and the fact that, as I said, you know, we tend to see patterns where there are none. Uh, so how do you distinguish to ensure that there is, if you were to train a machine on a data set, and it comes up with the recommendation time and again that there is indeed causality involved. It's a huge problem, right? Actually, the, some of the problems that uh, uh, we, we see in propagation of gossip is that people actually mistake correlation for causation and then pretend that's a fact. These things are... My favorite one is that um, if you buy skis, you're very likely to suffocate off your blankets. <laughs> so if you... I'm, I like skiing, right? But it's very dangerous not because of crashing, but because you might suffocate in your bed. Uh, I, th there is a huge problem with this because we have this perception now that is going on, and there are actually lots of people out there um, propagating that because there is a statistical correlation in, in any way, that that is proof for, for cause, and it just isn't, uh, because it is still determined by actions. By the way, this is a lot of people just use or try to use uh, AI techniques to predict something. How about we um, try and use AI to solve something right now. Like, instead of predicting the future, we're not very good at predicting the future. Our brains are much better than the typical AI network. How about we just try to solve the basic crap that we're doing every day? All right, I'll get to that in the second half of this, when, when we're digging deeper into AI. But my favorite causation and correlation example is um, uh, ice cream sales and forest fires. Obviously, they are highly correlated because typically during summertime, you know, you have lots of ice cream sales and lots of forest fires. But all a, uh, is a causality between the two. They all like ice cream. <laughs> it's not like every time I buy ice cream, someone lits, you know, lits a tree on fire. No. Okay, great. So um, now we talked about all the challenges around uh, uh, supervised learning, and uh, but also let's talk about opportunities. Some of the things we can do with it right now to indeed solve. Um, you know, some business problems. Give us, take us through some examples through work, through, you know, your interactions with academia or, or practitioners. Well, I, I would go beyond supervised learning because I believe that there is always a combination of algorithms you should be using. Um, but generally, um, what what we can really do well is replicate human experience and have that recombined in other ways and, and do this. I mean, we have, we have examples across the board of, of what we apply AI towards. We, we use it to build insurances, we use it to feed chicken, we use it to fly airplanes, we, and so on, right? You can do a lot of things, um, but machines just will not understand what they're doing, right? They're completely missing the semantics. You're giving them the environment that they work in, you're creating the semantics, and then they can compare um, what they get from their sensors to whatever there is as an understanding structure, they will never create it, their own understanding. Actually, you brought up two interesting points. One is the notion that um, you need to use a multitude of algorithms and, 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 and variety of techniques and tools because no, not one fits perfectly well into a problem you're solving. And the other two is a reference to a paradox that AI researchers and, uh, have kind of seen happening over many years ago. And that is contrary to common belief, this is Moravic uh, a paradox, uh, contrary to common belief, um, high cognitive uh, skills require little computation. It's quite easy for us to build machines that can beat humans at chess or checkers or go. 
but low level sensory motor skills cr take an, an enormous computational powers. It's, it's really difficult to teach a machine how to open a door that a four year old can do it easily. So I always joke that if you are a painter or a cook or a janitor, you, you are, your job in the future is a lot more secure better than a radiologist or a professor uh, or, or what have you. So <laughs> take us through that paradox. I'm, I keep saying this, right, is, is uh, probably in five years from now, a nurse will make more money than a doctor <laughs> um, because it's, it's much harder to reproduce um, than, than the pure medical knowledge. So uh, what you just said is one of the big challenges of AI. Like if you, if you get beyond this, we need more data uh, and everybody needs to handle their data, kind of what you hear in politics, there's three big challenges to AI. One being more X paradox, which also leads to a, a lot of wrong business decisions, right? When people think of, let's apply AI into business or into something in normal life, they typically think of, okay, let's start with something simple. And then they arrive with something simple that they can do. For example, everybody can talk. And then they try to use AI in, for example, customer service or, or chat bots and kind of that kind of, and they've actually just chosen the most difficult problem, right? Or uh, the, the second challenge is little data, right? How can you decide with, we constantly make decisions with not of enough information. Machines have this problem all the time. There's not enough data and machines just don't decide, right? There, there's the second. And the, the third one is knowledge transfer. Like you teach your machine today in an environment um, and in this environment, it can reproduce whatever you taught it. The problem is, will it go somewhere else? Like, can you have a machine that goes to math class and then is able to reuse that knowledge of adding numbers when it gets the bill in the restaurant? Right? Th th these are the three big challenges. And, and, and to give a, a like very, the AI 101 in five seconds, so you get around this, what, what machines can do. If you, have to, if you think about a lot of data coming in from sensory organs, like eyes, ears, whatever, there is skin, <coughs> and, and machines can have more sensors, like LiDAR, radar, whatever you give them. The job of finding a pattern and associating a positive action through either being shown or evolutionizing is, is what we call machine learning today. And the ability to like group these patterns, um, say you have associated, I can eat a herring, um, you can make an assumption and group that and say, well, there are many things that look like herring. I will assume that I can eat all of them, so I now only have to learn the exception that I can't eat the Japanese round fish, right? So um, this is conceptualization. This is currently the end of, this is, this is the top of the pops of where you get with machine learning. Um, and then humans went further, right? We actually have language, and language is the end of evolution. This is how we outperformed all the other species, is because we're able to communicate these associations, pattern actions, without actually try ever trying. Like I can tell you, don't touch that, it's gonna be hot, and you don't have to try. Like if you're a dad, you've tried this, a machine needs to try it about 70,000 times, even a disobedient child will only try once. Right, so is um, the, the ability to communicate knowledge further on is where we're really at the lowest level of, of natural language processing of the AIs. The thing that then dif differentiated homo sapiens from all the other human races that were out there before is, if you want to say this nicely and philosophically, it's our ability to have imagination. And if you want to say it a little more robust, it's our ability to simulate the future in our heads and weigh many different options against each other to find out which options we have. And if we put this into algorithms, we probably call it machine reasoning. So this is, this is I think, to me, a very important message. There's not one single algorithm that will solve it all, and it'll, it'll drive us down the wrong path, right? So it, for me, the, the 101 on AI, AI is, is these, at least these three. And because you alluded to Morvik's paradox in, in the, the beginning of, the, the challenge is that we have, all in all, what, roughly four billion years of evolution stored inside of us, um, and we only know non-Euclidean geometry for about 70 years. This is why non-Euclidean geometry is easier to reproduce for a machine than walking. The crocodile could also walk. So in essence, um, and you, you, you mentioned this at the beginning of our conversation, that you know, we have had a number of false starts in the world of AI. Uh, you know, and I feel like at the moment there is a little bit more hope. Perhaps now we have all the sensors and all the computational power and all the storage to be able to collect the data and structure it and analyze it. And in fact, 
pet peeve I have with many businesses, you know, executives, is that they all come and say, oh, we have our well-defined AI strategy. And I'm like, okay, before you even get there, uh, where, where does your data reside? Is it structured? Does, is it all digital? Does it talk to each other? Is it siloed or not? And they have like, they're looking at me like as if I'm from Mars. So the raw ingredients is very much missing, right? Well, th this is funny, right? Is a lot of businesses still dis discuss how to represent data uh, and everybody who, who knows that you need semantics started representing data as graphs quite a while back. But businesses still don't do that. For, for They've learned that data is the all of the 21st century. They have no clue what it is. They can't build engines out of it or make plastic, but they've learned the oil and you don't give away the oil. So they start storing it until they find out that data is actually, and they store it whichever way they get it, right? And this is where, where we find unstructured data sounds cool. What you need the unstructured data for, they don't know. That they store. They find out actually storing a lot of data costs a lot of money, and then they start doing something that they were able to do for the last 30 years, which is linear regression. And because it sounds boring, they call it predictive analytics. <laughs> and you can charge more as a consultant. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm willing to bet that uh, a good number of people in this audience have indeed created machines that are smarter uh, than them. And I'm referring to their children. Uh, so as evolution, you alluded to evolution, as it, you know, the, the, the engines that you're building are evolving. And as, as you compare it to human learning, how our children are much smarter and you know, learn technology faster than us, do you see kind of a parallel between that happening uh, in the world of uh, you know, AI and all the engines that are being built? So if I look, for example, what we're doing compared to a lot of the narrow AI approaches that are around there, the ability to tackle all kinds of problems with one engine and one data pool is a huge step. I mean, this is what you allude to with the children machine. And to, to one thing um, I really find strange, people are so afraid of being outperformed by a machine. I love to be outperformed by a machine. Man, I don't want to walk all the, I mean, fat, I'm, I don't want to walk all the way the car can go, right? I don't want to lift all the things a crane can lift. Why are we afraid of, out it's fantastic if a machine can outperform us. Well, in fact, that's my last comment as our time is running out. We could talk about this for days. But um, the fact that you know, people pit uh, machines against humans and the fact that a machine could beat a human against uh, a game of Go or chess, but I don't hear a lot of people talking about when a human and a machine are playing together, they can beat that machine more often than not. So give us your final 30-second thought on us and machines collaborating as opposed to competing. So I. I very strongly believe that all this super AI stuff is very far away. I don't, I'm a strong believer in Moore's law and I don't think that even if we can build a neural network large enough to represent the brain, we're still not there. Self-consciousness won't happen by accident, all of that stuff. So basically machines will be doing what we want them to do for quite a long time. Even with current machines, we can replace most business processes. So that doesn't mean we're not turning the economy upside down, which might be a good thing compared to what we just heard about the monopolies. So I, I think AI is kind of selling guns to the rest of the business, right? So, um, but but the, the point that we still are the, pe the people that make all the experiences that machines then can replicate, like machines do not create new experiences. And people like interacting with people more. So no matter what we do in the next 10, 20 years, it's all going to be machine-human collaboration, and humans are going to run it all, like all. The, the, the attempt to get rid of ethics and morale and put this into the court of the machine won't work, right? We, we are very responsible for that part, and we have, to, we have to really take care of that. Because who would want an AI drone to fly around and shoot people? Like, <laughs> I don't. So we, we have to, and this is a pattern-matching exercise. Right? We, we really don't want to automate that kind of stuff, and it's our job not to do it. But on that happy note, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. We'll be around, so I'll be, if any questions, feel free to come out throughout the conference and uh, enjoy the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Right. Thanks.